talk about that. And then I don't know the other you, you other two. Are you looking more for pests in general or? I'm yeah. fine with whatever. I'd say okay. we can talk about the deer. I'm kind of interested in it. Okay, and then and kind also, of see. We have a real problem with chipmunks. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's do this. Let me um, let me share screen and I'll jump right to a, some. Okay. I, I usually start with the diseases and and you know things like that and work through um, insects and such. But we'll go right to animals and birds. Okay. All right. So let me share my screen here for a moment. Uh, we'll go. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? Yep. Yes. All right. So what we'll do is we will go right to animals and birds and we'll, we can, because we can always come back to the rest of this if anybody's interested. I know that um, I just saw something testing your garden soil. Yes. I, last year you spoke at our garden club and uh, we took your advice. We had our soil tested. Good. <laughs> they sent me the um, results. I emailed them to you. Yeah. We picked them up and everything is planted. Hopefully everything is going to be growing well. Good. Oh, <laughs> oh wonderful. Good. Now, were you the one who emailed who wasn't home yet? from did you winter someplace else no oh, oh you were here okay no why i asked i remember your name but we had a couple people email their results to us and one was a family in florida and they wanted to be able to pick everything up when they got home and then all this happened i i don't know if they got home or not <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah that was whoops that that that's good all right so i'm going to start with pollinators since we talked briefly about bees earlier and Melanie you were talking about the, uh, the bumblebee on your porch there so I throw this slide in because a lot of people do not realize that pollinators are responsible for roughly one out of every three bites of food that you take whether it's um, you know pollinating almonds or your squash or any number of things um, one out of every three bites of food that you take and roughly 75 percent of the world's fruit and nut crops are pollinated by bees, butterflies, birds, things like that. So we, um, we're at the store, we're trying more and more to encourage people to not think about a quick fix chemical spray, but instead to choose natural products and treatments when they can. And of course, avoid neonics. I think um, a lot of countries in Europe have actually banned the use of neonics. And I think hopefully the US is kind of headed that way as well. Um, they are dangerous to bees and other pollinators because they're systemic, which means that the chemical goes throughout the whole plant, not just on the surface. You know, you might spray an aphid on the surface of this leaf, but if you treat it with a systemic product, all parts of the plant contain that chemical. And when you think about it, you know, we're eating that. It's going into our soil. It's moving throughout the different layers in the soil. Mm, not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Moving on. So animals and birds, we'll go right to this. So as I like to tell people, you know, you plant your garden, but the animals think that you have planted it for them and they enjoy it just as much as you do. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly we have a lot of deer around here. We have woodchucks. I have lovely fat woodchucks on my back lawn. Um, rabbits, do you see any rabbits, any of you? No. You know, in the 30 years I've lived here, I've seen maybe a handful of rabbits. So not a big problem for us around here, but certainly they are other places. Yeah. And of course, turkeys dig up a lot, as do chickens if you let them free roam. So lots of times, protecting your garden from animals is a matter of fencing. Either you fence the garden in or you're fencing the animals out, or in the case of your home raised chickens, you're fencing them in so that your gardens can be free. So there's a couple different ways of, uh, of fencing and of creating a barrier because not all barriers are fences. And one of, some of those are animal repellents. Um, animal repellents work on two principles, either they smell bad or they taste bad, and they can be a combination of the two. Lots of times they are based on a rotten egg of sulfur taste and smell. 
Uh, they work pretty well, although if you have a heavy rain, it's recommended that you go out and reapply them. They will say that they are water resistant up to so many days or so many weeks, but they say that about horse fly sprays too. And if I read the label, my horses would be just bloody messes from all the, the flies. You know, <laughs> I, I found around here, we really need to treat things a lot more frequently. So an example of the repellent is this repels all here. Uh, this is labeled for deer, chipmunks, raccoons, rabbits, armadillos, in case you have any of those around your yard, uh, skunks, squirrels, woodchucks, other assorted things. And this is based on rotten eggs, and it really does not smell good. Um, a lot of these chemical repellents, they come in a spray form or a granular or pellet form, so you can sprinkle it around your plants. And sometimes an animal will kind of lose their sensitivity to that taste, but there are a couple different brands of chemical repellents on the market. So if one stops working for you, try another one. They come in ready to use forms like this or concentrates as well. And another thing I brought, I didn't bring the whole bottle because it really does stink. Uh, a lot of people have success with urine repellents and the urine repellents are bobcat urine, coyote urine, and fox urine. And which one you pick depends on which kind of animal you're trying to keep away because each of those predators has a specific thing they like to eat. So in the case of fox, uh, fox love to get chipmunks and, and mice. So if you have a mouse problem, you might consider a fox urine outside. And the way those work, and again, I did not bring the urine home because they stink, they really do. <laughs> uh, but you put a few drops on a little cotton ball inside a little container like this, and you hang it on your shrubs. And certainly you can sprinkle it around your plants as well. Uh, the one that works against deer would most likely be a wolf or coyote urine. Now wolf urine we don't see too much in this area because we don't have a lot of wolves so the deer aren't really aware of that as a natural predator but certainly coyote urine is another arrow in your quiver so to speak. Of course another thing you can do to keep animals away is adjust your taste so that you are planting things that they don't like but maybe you really like hosta and you really want to keep the hosta. <laughs> so in that case, I think uh, your best bet would be to, to put down repellents to keep the deer away. Now there are products too, such as, uh, you may have heard of melorganite. Anybody heard of melorganite? It is a kind of a brown pelleted type product. It comes from basically from wastewater facilities and it's produced out in the Midwest. It has a uh, moderate amount of nitrogen in it. So it is used as a kind of a low level fertilizer, but the deer do not like the smell. So I like to use that around my garden because I'm doing a little bit of fertilizing and I'm repelling the deer too. And if you could see my backyard, I don't know if I can turn it so you can. You probably, probably can't see out through those French doors, but I have about 30 acres of woods out there. So I have a lot of deer. I have about five that come every night and they work their way into the horse pasture and they graze and then they leave. So milorganite is something I like to use around my house. Uh, if you have a friend who is a hairdresser and they are willing to share, you know, hair snippets with you, I don't know if that's even legal, <laughs> but deer do not like the smell of hair. And of course, if you have a male dog, take him outside in the morning and let him do his business around your garden. That'll help repel deer also. So there's any number of scent things that might help. Um, any questions so far? Is, no? it, is, it, is it true that dog fur will do the same thing? I think it would. I think it would because it, to them, it still smells like a predator. Yeah. Do you have a dog that sheds a lot? I have three. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You certainly could try it. <laughs> uh, all right. In Connecticut, we use coyote or because yeah. it really couldn't, but it worked. But yes. It was expensive. Yeah. And you put them on the little cotton balls. And yeah. They didn't have the little container that you just showed us. <laughs> Every time it rains, had to replace them. <laughs> Right, exactly, because all the a lot of that stuff does wash off. It, with the urines, especially if it's a male urine, it does tend to 
to stick, so to speak, a little more, um, but it's very much diluted by the rain. But yeah, I think I want to say it's about $17 or so for maybe an eight ounce bottle. And a little bit, as you probably recall, a little bit does go a long way. Yeah, yeah. Um, other rodents, anybody having trouble with woodchucks? Yes, yeah. I have to tell you before we go any further, when I was growing up, I had a pet woodchuck. We caught him as a baby. My father had shot his mother, not realizing that she had kits. And uh, they usually have several in a litter. And about a week later, this little furry bundle kind of started staggering around the yard and we realized it was a baby woodchuck and it was probably the last one of the litter. And my father just couldn't kill that. So we brought it in the house and we fed him milk with a sponge and a syringe and uh, let him go eventually. But he, they are, I can attest, they are smart little buggers. You would not <laughs> believe how smart a woodchuck can be. And I could tell you stories for half an hour about Sebek, but... Anyway, we want to keep them out of the garden, not invite them in the house. So <laughs> they, they really like tender things, tender shoots, leaves, seedlings, um, you know, just as, yeah, yeah, just as your stuff gets going, that's when they become interested. And remember, they tend to have large litters, any number of rodents, and that's because they are low on the food chain. There have to be a lot of them to keep the species going because there are so many things above them that eat them. So if you have a woodchuck, a female woodchuck, you can be pretty sure you're gonna have a couple litters of kits during the summer and you'll have a lot of little woodchucks running around. Now, some people, um, well, let's see, let me back up for a minute. Um, so that makes it obviously very hard to totally eradicate that population. And if you do eradicate a burrow, you know, you kill everybody in the burrow, basically you have left a vacant apartment and somebody else is gonna come along and move in because that's what rodents love to do. They love to find a place where somebody else has done all the work and they just move right in. So again, barriers, barriers are good. Uh, they they're actually are small pet, what they call pet size electric fence chargers. You can put on a, a fence around your garden that will keep woodchucks out. My mother used to have one after the woodchuck incident, and you know, we decided we were done raising woodchucks. Um, <laughs> she had one around her garden. It was only maybe eight inches tall, a little charger on it, but it kept the woodchucks out. Uh, a lot of woodchucks and other animals though will burrow, especially chipmunks, and come up in your garden. So if you're going to put a fence around the garden, you may have to dig a trench and put that fence down below the surface as well to, to help stop anybody from burrowing in. Uh, repellents can help. Again, the fox urines and the coyote urines and the bobcat urine is good for, um, for things like, um, oh, woodchucks. Um, mice, not so much chipmunks. Members of the cat family don't really like to eat chipmunks. They're fun to catch, but they don't want to eat them after. So a bobcat would rather go after something that he can eat later on. Fox will go after chipmunks though. So there's a couple ideas there as far as the urine. Um, there are other repellents too. We talked about this repels all that is based on rotten eggs, but there are other ones that have a hot pepper taste. Those can be effective against rodents. In fact, there are bird seeds out there that have hot pepper, chili pepper mixed in with them and that the birds cannot taste that, but the squirrels and the chipmunks can and they tend to leave that seed alone or, or rather they, they wait till all the other seed is gone before they attack that. Uh, they also do not like things such as castor oil and cedar oil and clove and garlic oil. Um, it's very offensive to their, their um, sense of smell. Any questions there? Yes. Uh, so I have a question actually. We're, we're having um, chipmunks nibble on our, our seedlings. And mm -hmm. I was playing around on Pinterest and I found a recipe for using um, dried red pepper seeds, the chili flakes. Yep. And you basically reduce it in water and make like a syrup of it. So we've been trying yep. that. Um, and have you noticed that, is it helping? I, I've tried it for two days, so I don't oh, know. okay. I bet um, it will. I bet it, it will because, you know, basically if you're making a syrup, you're kind of concentrating that. Yeah. And, uh, and rodents do have that kind of, those kind of taste buds. 
So, so yeah, it, it probably we were like it. boiling it in the kitchen. It was like mace, pepper spray. I couldn't stop coughing. Oh, oh yes, God. yes. I have done that, making hot peppers, dumped the spices in all at once and fumigated the entire house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like painful. But theoretically that'll help with the um the chipmunk. Yeah, I think and it then, will. If we're having problems with like beetles as well, is there something we can do similar? Um, why go back up in a moment and talk about insects? All okay. right, remind me if I don't go back, but uh, we'll we'll go back and talk about insects. All right, we'll move on here. Oh, oh, one more thing. Yeah, if you, of course, this is a time of year when we see a lot of moles and bulls. The way to tell the difference is moles starts with M. Meat eaters. They eat bugs. They are the ones that dig up your lawn. They're the ones that leave those little tunnels and those little clumps of dirt in your lawn. Uh, voles are vegetarians, V and V. So although they may be digging up your lawn, they're not doing it to get grubs and worms. They're more apt to go after seeds and things like that. All right, moving on. Oops, oh, I hate when I do that. Let's see. Okay, deer, here we go. All right. So as you know, they like a lot of the same things you do, whether it's veggies or hosta, flower buds. Uh, their taste can change over time, and it depends on the time of year, too, and how hungry they are as to what they will eat. So if there are plenty of other things for them to graze on, like my pasture, they're probably not going to come up on my front lawn and bother the hosta. But if it's winter and they're hungry and they're getting desperate, anything is fair game. So part of the trick is to... Um, maybe offer them something else. Maybe if you can put plant clover in your backyard, helps the bees, keeps the deer busy, keeps them away from some of your more decorative, decorative plants. If you are going to use a fence, deer fence should be about seven feet high because those guys can jump and they're very adept at that. And they can ooze through a three wire electric fence. That's what they do with my horse pasture. They can jump over it. Um, they're very graceful about it. <laughs> uh, if you're going to put up a deer fence, then the wire mesh or something woven is best because they can really ooze between just strands of wire. Again, repels all helps. Any unfamiliar smell is something that they're very suspicious of at first, but they do become used to things. So in that case, if, you, if your deer problem is really bad, you would want to change out your repellents every so often, you know, maybe try the repels all. Uh, there's a product called, I think it's called shotgun, that's a repellent. Uh, try the urines, keep switching it up so that they don't get too used to it and realize that, oh, hey, nothing is really going to harm me here. You know, I just, it's irritating, but I can stand that. Uh, there are sonic devices that help repel deer because they're uh, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They hear at a different pitch than we do. I have to say though, I'm having trouble finding those this year. And I don't know if it's that the companies are making something else or, um, or I just, you know, they're just not well supplied somewhere. I haven't been able to find them this year. And of course, there's always planting deer resistant varieties. And again, deer, if they're really hungry enough though, they will go after that too. And again, we talked about the repels all, hot pepper wax is another thing, coyote urine. Um, birds, anybody having trouble with birds in your garden? No, okay, we could skip that and go back. I'm um, basically, you know, cover, cover things. Uh, domestic animals, anybody having trouble with dogs and cats and chickens? I guess cats. We're at we'll a coffee table. table. <laughs> <laughs> the garden. But they like to use our, our garden box. Uh, every year. Oh, yes. Yeah, cats do like that. So there are things, cats are very scent sensitive. So there are things you can do that, that will keep the cat out of your garden. They don't like um, the smell of different mints, like peppermint, spearmint, and such. They, they don't like that. So, you know, if you're going to plant an actual mint plant, be very careful because they will overrun everything. But it doesn't hurt to go out and sprinkle around some essential oils of, of mint and such. Cats don't act too crazy about that. But do not use that repelzol. Do not use this um, or any hot pepper, well, rather any hot pepper repellents or mothballs with cats because they are poisonous to cats. Actually, I think that repels all will be okay because that is um, rotten egg based, uh, but don't use any 
any cat any of that hot pepper syrup around could you cat. could you tell my cat rufus that because he tried to stick his face in the pepper spray that i made of course he would have to yeah he'd yeah. have to try it <laughs> yeah he, he's not very smart no <laughs> well i think the danger is more that um if you know if anything gets on the cat they have to lick it off they have to keep themselves clean and and ingesting too much of it is just not good for them so and of course another thing you could do is you could plant catnip for rufus so he will leave the rest of your garden alone well rufy is an indoor cat he is very uh, spoiled very very, uh, very spoiled <laughs> we bring the catnip inside <laughs> yes he does he has his own well, here are some things that cats don't like. Um, rosemary, lavender, garlic, chives, geranium. I can attest to the garlic chives. I have several in clumps right outside my barn door right now. And even my horse that eats everything won't bite those. So they're pretty effective. Uh, geranium and, and citrus things. All right, let's go back to bugs. All right, we'll start right here, insects and others. Okay, and remind me, you said you have beetles? I'm assuming they're beetles. Um, okay. But we also have grubs. Okay, grubs in your lawn. I, yeah, um, I've, I dug up a couple of uh, weeds that were in the lawn and the little gray, nasty things. Yeah, kind of C-shaped. Yeah, with yeah. red heads. Okay, so they could be, um, they could be the, the grub form of the Japanese beetle or they, there are, um, cinch bugs that lay a, a grub shape that's similar in color and size to the Japanese beetles. Uh, yeah, and we have, let's see, it's been two years, I think, since we really had a very bad grub problem. So, you know, these things go in cycles, so we could see a lot this year. Uh, have you had Japanese beetles around your house? They come out in June? Not sure. No. Yeah. Not sure. Okay. Last year, we didn't have any. Last year was weird, wasn't it? I really expected a bumper crop of them because two years we had so many grubs. But I'm wondering, too, last year we had a winter that was very icy. Remember how a, a, a year ago all our snowstorms turned into rain and then froze? So I don't know if that had an effect on the grubs or not but I was really surprised how few Japanese beetles we had last year. So hopefully that means good news for us this year in terms of yeah. rubs. Um, hopefully, you know, they, there just wasn't enough of a population to be a big problem. But if you do have grubs, um, there are ways to treat it that are chemical based or natural based. And the chemical stuff is things like seven and grub X. Anytime you put down chemical like that, you want to pay attention to the back of the package where it tells you what rate to put it down. A lot of those bags, they'll say, especially Seven is famous for this, they'll say, this bag treats 10,000 square feet. Well, yes, it will if you're putting it down very sparsely, but if you have a grub problem and you need to put it down heavier, you're not gonna get 10,000 square feet of coverage out of that. So flip that bag over, take a look at the back, see the dispersal rate on it. If you don't want to go with a chemical version, uh, there is a product called Milky Spore, which is, um, it's, uh, it is a beneficial disease, I guess is the best way to, 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 to uh, call it. It's something that will not harm your grass, but it will kill the grubs. Basically, you're giving the lawn um, a good dose of this, this um, I believe it's a bacteria-based item that the grubs cannot tolerate, but the grass does not care about. Uh, it's something that in this area of the country, it can work well. It uh, works better in some areas than others, but you do have to put it down three times to get it really established in your lawn. And then it'll last for for several years. Things like the seven and the grub X, you really need to put them down once a year or maybe even twice a year if you're having a really bad infestation. Um, as far as other beetles, there's like, like 10,000 varieties of beetle in the world. What it's the biggest. The, uh, what about the Asiatic lily beetles? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have the, I just have a couple of, uh, I, I'm not a big Asian, you know, Asian lily fan, but I have mm -hmm. some beautiful ones that were in the garden before I moved and they're still there and they started yeah. popping up and sure enough, there's like, they're Those, covered with Asian lily beetles. 
Okay, so there are chemicals out there that are listed specifically for those beetles. I would encourage you though, if, as much as possible, to hand pluck them and dunk them in soapy water to kill them. Because um, again, you know, if you're trying to protect the pollinators in your area, even if it's a product that is specific to that beetle, it still can have effects on the other pollinators. And anytime you pick a chemical, like whether it's, you know, this repels all or, or I have other examples here, copper fungicide, which is a natural product. There are three things you need to look for on the label. One is that it actually treats your problem. Mm -hmm. If you have thrips and the bottle that you picked off the shelf does not list thrips, it's not going to take care of your problem. <laughs> the second part is that it has to work on the plant that you have. So if you have, say, an African violet and you're trying to treat it for something and it does not list African violet as a plant that you can use this chemical on, you might kill your plant. And then the third thing is just follow the, follow the directions as far as how much of a treatment and how often. Um, more is not better when it comes to chemicals. All it does is either poison your soil or poison your plant or create resistant bugs, which is not what we want. And of course, if you put less of the product on it, um, that's not gonna solve your problem. So those three, three things are really important with any treatment that you do. Got to treat the problem, got to treat the plant and have to follow the, you know, the right concentration and directions. Questions on that? What are thrips? Thrips are, <clears throat> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so this is, can you, I'll see the picture in the upper right-hand corner. That is what a thrip looks like. And when I made up this particular PowerPoint, I picked some of the most common bugs that you might see in a garden and in a greenhouse. And thrips are bugs that just, if you have a thrip problem, you have a huge, huge, huge number of, of these little bugs. And the way they damage a plant is that they suck the sap out of the plant and they lay their eggs inside the leaf. So they really decimate the whole plant because the leaf is important in in that it collects sunlight, tra you know, translates that to food and an energy source for the plant. So anything that damages the leaves, it's gonna kill the plant pretty quickly. Um, there are uh, many different types of thrips and some will bite you as well, leave kind of an itchy, you know, itchy little bumps on you. Uh, another bad thing about thrips is they, because they go from plant to plant, they spread disease from one plant to another. Luckily, they don't fly well, though. So if you have the ability to do so, you can knock them off with a you know, good strong hose. Of course, you might, if you have a weak plant, you might damage your plant doing that, too. Uh, they also don't like to be wet. So helping, uh, keeping your plants irrigated or misted, especially in the house, can help mitigate the, uh, the amount of thrips that you have. And if you want to treat them, there are natural products such as spinosad and horticultural oil. Um, if you're familiar with Uncle Jack's Dead Bug Brew, anybody ever heard of that? Dead Bug Brew? That, I know it's a great name, isn't it? <laughs> Uncle Jack's. <laughs> it's, um, it's a spinosad based product, which is an all natural product. And I like to bring that up because it has kind of an interesting history. It's fairly new in the world of treating insect problems. And when I say fairly new, probably within the last 10 or 15 years. And it was discovered in this old gin mill, I think it was gin or whiskey mill in Central America. And that had been abandoned. This building had been abandoned, but um, however it happened, somebody, you know, doing research in the area said, hey, there are no bugs around this building. Why is that? And that's how Spinosad was discovered. It was there in that particular area. Somebody, you know, obviously there was a lot of research done. Somebody finally isolated this, this particular natural element, not element, chemical, and said, oh, this is what it is. And now it's a huge, huge product in the fight against insects um, for people who want to do it in a natural manner. Uh, some of the other natural products are sulfur. I think I have some here. Yep, plant fungicide. Uh, uh, can be an insecticide as well as a fungicide. Uh, pyrethrins, which are derived from chrysanthemums, insecticidal soaps. 
And then there are, of course, the chemical-based products such as malathion and lambda sihalothrin. Sihalothrin, there. Um, any questions on that slide? No? Any others on bugs? I have a question on insecticidal soap. Yes. I bought some last year. Is it still good or does it? Um, I would uh, take the top off and give it a good sniff. If it smells kind, still kind of clean and soapy, it's okay. Um, if it has, if it's developed kind of a sourish smell or an off smell, I would toss it. But lots of times that stuff is good for a few years. Yeah. Thank you. Give it a good shake first. Right, shake it up to get all the, you know, all the, everything in it all mixed evenly. Yeah. Any other questions about, let's see what else we have for bugs here, beetles, oh, more on beetles. Okay, yeah, over 25,000 kinds of beetles worldwide. And there are good beetles, such as ladybugs, um, dung beetles are good beetles, bad beetles, such as the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, there are some really ugly beetles, like the American carrion beetle. And if you haven't seen that, you can Google it. <laughs> and interesting thing about beetles is that some are extremely plant specific. They only go after a certain plant and others are much less picky. They'll go after any number of things. Um, like Japanese beetle, you know, you find them on your tomatoes, you find them on your roses, on your blueberries. They are pretty, pretty general. Whereas the asparagus beetle, only on the asparagus. Uh, they can damage all parts of the plant, and because they do move from plant to plant, they can carry disease from plant to plant as well. And again, a couple ideas to take care of them, the, the hand picking into soapy water, the spinosad, pyrethrins. Uh, permethrin, next line down, they're under synthetic products. Permethrin is the man-made version of pyrethrin. So pyrethrin is natural, derived from chrysanthemums, and permethrin is our human attempt at making a similar product. All right, and this is again a time when it's so important to read the label on your, on your bottle of, you know, designated insecticide because, again, some of those beetles are generalists and some are specific. So if you're going after that asparagus beetle and it does not list asparagus beetle on the label, probably won't kill that asparagus beetle. Any questions? No? I just looked up the American carrion beetle and it is gross. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty ugly, isn't it? <laughs> Some beetles are pretty amazing though. I I have been trying for years. And dung beetles are not as generalist as you might think. That is a, a camel dung beetle will not take care of a horse pasture like mine. I really wanna find some beetles that will take care of my horse pasture so I don't have to go out picking up horse poop because I never have time for that and I have several horses. And dung beetles can move an amazing amount of product. They, what they do is they, they roll it up and they roll it up and they, you know, they kind of ball it all up and then they do whatever they do with it, whether they lay their eggs in it or whatever, but they can remove an amazing amount of manure from land, but I cannot find any horse dung beetles. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect they probably wouldn't live very, wouldn't overwinter here anyway, but I'd be willing to try it every year if I could find some. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. Uh, any interest in slugs and snails and caterpillars and things like that? Um, I, I've tried um, egg shells and I've grind, you know, I've ground them up and I have a nice little container this year. Uh -huh. ready, I'm ready for them. Very good. <laughs> for the what slugs. <laughs> what does that do? Oh, well, it's got sharp edges and yeah. they would they're not going to be able to crawl over them they're <coughs> excuse me i crushed them i rolled them with a rolling pin after yeah. i cooked them in the low low oven yeah so, very good so you put them in the soil no i put them on top of the soil so yeah. slugs aren't gonna or snails are not gonna climb over them because right. they got soft they have soft bodies and the shells will. That's interesting. Yeah. 
<laughs> some other ideas too, kind of along that, you know, something that they can't get over. Uh, I knew this, this gardener once who, uh, he had an immaculate garden. He would put down like black plastic or black mulch cloth. And then each, he would save uh, like yogurt containers and the old um, margarine containers and he cut the bottoms out and each plant had a little ring around it. And there are certain slugs and snails that will not climb up on that plastic. So each, each plant had its own little barrier. And also when he watered, that was a good way to ensure that the water was more directed towards the root of the plant. But it, I mean, to look out over here, his garden, it was all these plants perfectly spaced and these little rings around them. <laughs> but, you know, he had a, a gorgeous garden because nothing ever, ever made it over those rings to, uh, to eat his plants. So. Wow. <laughs> yep. A few years back, people were saying, oh, you put little containers of beer out. Well, I was tired of feeding the slugs our beer. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, that just, they, they just keep, dry. I remember doing that when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Dad, like he'd say, watch this, the slugs will go to it. And what does it do? It kills them? Well, yeah, they're attracted to it and then they drown in it basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you if you put salt on them, they do kind of shrivel and dry up because especially the slugs, not so much the snails, um, because it, their outer coat is basically it, their mucus covered and um, salt will suck the moisture out of them, so to speak. And some other ideas are diatomaceous earthworks, kind of like your eggshells, just a very fine, sharp particle that to us looks like maybe a flower, but microscopically it's very sharp. And that again will uh, cut into their soft underbody and basically dry them out. So a lot of these things, there's, there's really no one thing that will treat all your bug problems. It's more a question of having a lot of arrows in your quiver. And you know, you if this works a little bit, that's great, but it may not take care of everything. So have this as a backup, or you know, try these couple of different things. Do some physical uh, things like uh, barriers. Do some um, natural products. It, it's it's well, it's like trying to control flies. You know, there's no one thing that works. It, it's it's a multifaceted approach. Questions? Moving on here. Let's see, we can go back to the beginning of this if anybody wants to talk about soil. Um, we'd Because we had mentioned a little bit about so oh, your soil tests earlier. I have a um, one one small garden where okay. I just, just grow squash in it. And the squash grow well, except the soil is, it's dark, it's good, but it's very clay. Can I just put okay. sand in that to? You could certainly add some sand to help lighten it up. Uh, gypsum will help lighten it up as well. Yep, sand might be a little easier though. Is to it work just, in. just regular um, pool sand or sandbox sand? Uh, you would want something like a playground sand, something that's clean. Yeah. Yeah. And it will be some work, you know, over time to break that up. Another thing you could do too, is it, is it really hard pack? It, it's, it's all clumps. Okay. All right. Um, you might try just for fun. Uh, first thing in the spring, plant some radishes in it before you try mixing anything in. Radishes are great at busting up soil and they would be all done by the time you're ready to put in your squash because squash likes to be warm. And you could also mix in some, some things like peat moss or compost that will help lighten the soil as well as the sand, but add some nutrients too that the sand would not. So that might be a good approach. Try busting it up with the carrots, I'm uh, sorry, uh, with the radishes. Okay. Pull the radishes, you know, because they're all they're all done pretty early. We're just now getting to the point where you put squash seedlings in, and um, you know, let the radishes do the heavy work, and then add in till in some compost, and um, and then try your squash. Great, thank you. Yeah. There are actually what they call tillage. The radishes I'm talking about are the ones you you can pull and enjoy in your salad, but there are actually crops called tillage radishes. 
T-I-L-L-A-G-E. And that is their entire purpose. They're seated across the whole field just to bust up that hard packed soil. And you know, they're nothing that ever go to market or anything. They just get uh, chopped up and tilled under, but that's their whole purpose is to lighten up a field, bust it up. Yeah. Any other questions? That's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool huh, when you think about it. <laughs> when you start looking at all these little little things you can do. Or uh, lately, I've been interested in the I forget the the proper term. Um, the the more of the old timers idea of instead of planting by the calendar, we'll ignore that. Plant by what's going on around you. So some examples are. We're going to ignore the phone. Um, they say, well, like Pacifia, treat your crabgrass before the Pacifia changes from yellow to green because that, that's what the temperature is right, the moisture is right. Um, these things go hand in hand in nature. Uh, plant your peas. What's the, what was it with the peas? Oh, and I was going to remember it. I think peas you plant about the time of... Uh, Pacithia too. Plant your corn when the oak leaves are the size of a squirrel's ear. <laughs> so catch your neighborhood squirrel, check out his ear size, <laughs> compare it to your oak leaves. Um, but you know, I think there's more of a movement back to that toward instead of saying, oh, today's May 21st, we should be doing this. Take a look around outside and say, okay, lilacs are out now. What does well to be planted when the lilacs are out? more of a nature-based calendar than a human-based calendar. I, I actually do have one more question that's... Sure. So um, it's, I have three dogs and for several years ago, they, they got very, very sick and, and they were suspected that it was some kind of toxin introduced by lawn chemicals by my neighbors. Ah, okay. And so I've been really, really reluctant. I, I, I use no chemicals and I've just let my lawn go and I, my yeah. dogs are more valuable to me than my lawn. Yeah. So this yeah. year I got white clover seed and I'm replacing a lot, you know, like wherever this patch is, I'm putting clover in to eventually have a clover lawn rather than, mm -hmm. than, but can you think of any other plants that would be good? I have really, really sandy soil. Okay. Well, first, I'm glad to hear that you're using white clover for a number of reasons. Um, bees like clover. And of course, I'm a, I'm a bee person. <laughs> also, you'll find with clover, there's evidence. I don't know that anybody's really done a formal study on it, but there seems to be evidence that lawns containing clover have less of a grub problem. So going down the road, you know, you, you hopefully will see the benefits of that. Uh, let's see. Things that like sandy soil. Um, I'm trying to think of what's out in my backyard here. <laughs> <laughs> there are, well, watch out for crabgrass. Crabgrass likes sandy soil. It roots any place where it can get a foothold quickly and easily. And um, if you do see any of that, you'll want to just pull it out because it will take over your whole lawn. But there are, yeah, there are any number of grasses that are happy with a sandy soil. In fact, your ideal soil for grass seed is what is technically known as sandy loam. And if I go back here, yeah, see that big pyramid there. Um, let's see, so sandy loam is kind of in the lower, um, lower angle of the triangle there. Um, and, and for most grasses that are around here, they're gonna be pretty happy in that. If you think it's too sandy, it's a pretty easy process to have some loam delivered and, and kind of put a, a thin layer of that over the top to help the grass seed get started. Yeah. Because grass seed will start easier in loam than it will in, in sandy things. And, um, and, you know, over time, the roots will work down through that loam and into the sand. Now I have had, I put a lot of money into a sand riding ring in the past and I can attest that grass will work its way into sandy areas because I'm doing constant battle to keep my sand riding ring as a sand riding ring. <laughs> but so, if you want to get a jump start, you know, certainly you could consider a thin Well, layer I've noticed of that, I don't know where it came from, but um, I don't know whether it's called a juga or a juga. 
is growing all over the lawn as well, which actually I don't care. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm having, I can't picture that. What is it? What does it's, it look like? Is it a, it's like a vine? Tiny, it, it's like really invasive and it makes tiny little purple flowers. Oh, like ground ivy. Maybe. Sort of. Yeah. But it, it's yeah, so that's little, kind of, little stalks like that with a purple flower on top. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Local name is, is ground ivy. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, I'm that letting that go too, because that, you know, yeah. that seems to be sort of resistant because I mean, it, well, so the other part of it is that the area that they play in is now a horse sand ring. Yes. <laughs> and I'm afraid it will be. <laughs> so, and it seems like things might be sort of coming back to that area, but I haven't even okay. tried to plant anything, but in the, yeah. in the summer, it's awful because they come in and they're covered with dust. Oh yes. Yeah. So there are grass seeds that are high traffic area type grass seeds, um, like the Ware Green line or Scott's probably has a line similar to that. And it's the type of grass that's in it that stands up to foot traffic and animals. Um, but if your dogs are playing vigorously and tearing up the lawn, I mean, you might just have to say, okay, this is the section of the lawn where you get to do what you want. And I'll wipe you down when you come in. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much. Either that or get them to kind of, if, I don't know if they kind of move around so that you could you know, spread out the, uh, um, spread out the, the foot traffic, spread out the damage. <laughs> they, they're, they're lunatics, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they're actually ripping it up, that's kind of, you know, if they're playing so hard that the roots of the grass are being disturbed, that's, that's kind of a toughie there. Yeah. yeah. I suppose you could fence that area off and let it recover and, um, you know, just kind of, I don't know, encourage them to play other areas as such, but yeah, that's, that's tough. <laughs> They're happy though. <laughs> that's good. Happy dog. It's a good dog. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? No. All right. Well, good. I have no idea what time. Oh. We went almost an hour. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Valerie. Oh, my we pleasure. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Nice Very to see good. all you sorts of friendly people. <laughs> yes. And thank you for supporting libraries the way you do. That's oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I, I'm a big fan of libraries. I started volunteering when I was 12, so I have a long history. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope we can do this again, again Certainly. I think it, we could just Certainly. open it up to questions. Yeah, absolutely. Really nice to have those things answered. Absolutely. Well, Brought all my reference so books just in case. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice to see you all and yes, thank you. Thank you, and have, Valerie. Bye, have bye, a great Barbara. evening. Bye. 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 Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Danny. Thanks. <laughs>